This episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we're going to dig into the issue of dredges. Yeah, I went there. We're going to have a special guest on board, Megan Milliken Biven. She's going to talk about recent articles she had in Current Affairs, but more importantly, she's going to talk about her stated policy to, towards why we need a U.S. public dredging fleet. All on this episode of What the Dredge. I'm your host, Sal McCoglin. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On with Shipping. Today, we got a special edition. It, it's the what's, what's the Dredge edition of What's Going On with Shipping. And to talk about dredging, I decided to bring in an expert in the field. She's not working currently on a dredge, but she has written extensively about U.S. dredge policy. And that is Megan Milliken Biven. Megan, hello, guten tag, because uh, you're coming to us all the way from Austria. Three Scots. That's how they say it in Austria. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, my my, uh, my uh, German in Austria is not as good as as my German in uh, along the ports of the Elbe River. Uh, Megan, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, we're coordinating across time zones today for coming on. But this is a topic that has really generated a lot of interest, obviously, over the grounding of the Ever Forward, which has now been released and back afloat and heading on our own way. But we've seen dredging in the headlines with Ever Given in the Suez ever forward in Baltimore. So I thought first, if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself, and then we'll take the concept of dredging in the United States as a topic. Okay. Um, so my name is Megan Milliken Biven. I am the founder of an organization called True Transition, which actually focuses on finding opportunities and work for displaced oil and gas workers in the United States. But prior to that, I was a policy wonk at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management where I worked with the Marine Minerals Program. And that is the program where, you know, if states or other groups need access to federal sand and federal waters, um, that's who they go through. And so that's how I kind of came to dredging as an issue. So uh, I, I know people over at BOEM, so always a, a really interesting organization, obviously, for what they do in the Gulf. And I also uh, took a look at the site that you're developing for your new project, and I'll be sure to have those in the show notes so everybody can take a look at them and follow along on the work you're doing. So dredging obviously became an issue. I went on the Odd Lots podcast and we talked about Ever Forward. And of course, I mentioned the 1906 Foreign Dredge Act, and that started a whole range of topics <laughs> about, about the issue. But I thought first, maybe if you can take us through, you know, briefly the history of dredging in the United States, why this is such a unique topic, why is it so important to the United States, obviously, and uh, then we'll talk about the current situation. All right, we got to, I'm like, let me put it in my notes, we got to go back to 1802, folks, um, to when the Army Corps of Engineers was founded and put into, the, you know, I mean, actually, the Army Corps of Engineers was there at the Revolution, you know, that's one of the oldest federal agencies in the American government. Um, dredging as a topic um, and as like a policy area was there from the beginning. Inland navigation is one of the earliest pretenses for federal authority. Um, in 1824, in the Supreme Court case Gibbons versus Ogden, um, you know, the court ruled that you know federal government had authority over the states with uh, navigational servitude. I think is that the proper term, I'm not sure. Um, but that is when you have you know, this robust assertion that the government can come into the states and ensure that waterways are navigable. And one, a big issue was when like river banks would collapse in, they would pull trees, and these big trees would be sticking out of the water and, you know, puncture a hull of a boat and, you know, just cause chaos in their wake. And so they created these things called, they would call, um, what is it, Uncle Sam's tooth pullers that would pull out the snagged trees in the middle of the riverbank. And so it begins there. You know, the government has been doing this for a very long time. I don't want to like keep on going into the history. So you keep on queuing up. No, that, that's great. I mean, first of all, you mentioned Gibbons versus Ogden, which makes a historian like me very happy. So, you know, anytime we can talk about some good Supreme Court uh, navigation uh, uh, legislation, I am all for it. And uh, as a matter of fact, for, for those of us watching, I'll be sure to include a link on Gibbons and Ogden because there's a great video on that that gives you some more detail. I actually talk about it a lot because, I, you know, it's, it's a weird situation we have in the United States where the U.S. federal government controls the waters, but it's the states and the municipalities that control the land. And that creates kind of a, a very unique kind of intersection between the two that we've talked about in the supply chain crisis with ports. But when it comes to dredging and, and, and more importantly, maintaining the depth of water in the United States, that, as you said, has fallen upon the Army Corps of Engineers. 
And largely what we've seen is the development of a fleet of dredging. And in the Army Corps of Engineers, from coastal defense to uh, navigable waterways, has really controlled the waters of the United States. And so what, what's the status of the Army Corps of Engineers dredging fleet? You know, how's that developed over the past, you know, since the Dredging Act of 1906? You know, well, let's actually go to that first. Let, let's talk about why the Dredging Act of 1906. We have to go before that, right? Um, we have to go right before that in the late 1800s when, you know, the port of New York was, you know, there's this new generation of ocean liners coming into the port and they can't get in. They need to have new, um, you know, the Gedney Channel, I forget the name of the other channel, um, the main ship channel needed to be dredged to a certain depth for those new vessels yep. to approach. Ambrose coming and in there. Mm -hmm. The Ambrose Channel coming in. Yeah, the Amber, well, John Wolfe Ambrose, there's yeah. our hero. Jan, John Wolfe Ambrose was a, um, an Irish immigrant uh, minister who saw you know, the future of the ocean as the future of New York. And he and a few other citizens really lobbied Congress to say, you know, you need to, you know, you need to dredge this channel to an appropriate depth. And during this period of time, over about 15, 20 years, there were a series of contractors and different methods that were employed to try and dredge the channel to the appropriate depth, and they all failed. Um, and eventually the, 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 the Army Corps person in charge said, you know, if we had our own fleet, we could save the cost of profit and we get to keep the boats. And so that's what they did. They used the vessels they had and they were able to successfully dredge the channel to the appropriate depth, eventually naming it for John Wolf Ambrose, the Ambrose Channel. Um, and um, that became a fixed administrative principle that the Army Corps of Engineers would have its own dredge fleet. And the Marine Division was established in DC where they would be, you know, naval architects and marine engineers developing new generation vessels. You know, the, the hopper dredge, as we know, you know, before these were not ocean going vessels. You know, it was basically a piece of heavy construction on top of like a barge and they couldn't really um, go into the open waters. And it was the Army Corps of Engineers who actually engineered, you know, and developed these vessels. And, you know, wouldn't the, the Belgians and the Dutch would eventually take notice and say, hey, those are pretty good concepts. Um, but it was a bit, first and foremost developed in the United States. And as you know, the, the document said, like if you read some of the earlier um, newspaper articles and like letters to the editor and all these things, it became a fixed administrative principle that the Army Corps of Engineers would maintain its own fleet because the Foreign Dredge Act was passed in 1906. And you know, our gentleman on the Odds Lots uh, podcast talked about the Galveston hurricane um, where the city uh, elevated itself um, and they used Dutch dredgers and that's when, you know, private contractors cried a foul and said, you know, no fair. So the Foreign Dredge Act was introduced. And, you know, I'm not against protectionism on a level. I think it's smart industrial policy. Um, and, but it became a fixed administrative principle of the Army Corps to maintain its own fleet to ensure that, you know, the government will be protected from a monopoly. And that's explicitly said. They said, if we do not have our own fleet, we will be at the mercy of a monopoly. And so that's where we were in the 1900s. And, you know, I think right, like, I, should, I don't have the exact number, but about, you know, like 80 vessels of various type and status were built after that law. And, you know, the Army Corps were very active on both the Western and uh, Pacific fronts during World War II and, you know, many other military campaigns. Though, so, like, Army Corps of Engineers is very much active in ensuring that, you know, our troops and um, equipment have access. And, you know, I mean, all those vessels were deployed during World War II, and a lot of them were damaged. And so in the 1950s, you have a, a smaller fleet of public dredge vessels and, you know, we hadn't updated or uh, invested in a long time. And so the Corps is just waiting for that investment. And that sets the stage for the next chapter, if you have any questions right now. No, I, I just like to go back for a second, because, you know, when you start talking about the dredge fleet, and the, the dredge act of 1906, I mean, this follows right along with my studies where I study uh, military sea lift and how the army and the military transport ship uh, crews overseas and troops overseas. And the U.S. does the same exact thing. I mean, 1898, they create the army transport service to carry their troops because they can't rely on foreign, uh, I mean, on commercial shipping. There's no American shipping out there and I don't want to be relying on foreign shipping. So what do they do? They buy a fleet of vessels. They operate them under their own guise. They, they create the mine, uh, mine planting service, which is a, a group of smaller coastal boats that they station in U.S. ports that can be used to plant mines in case of a war because you know, for some strange reason commercial ships don't like having explosives on them uh you know so they they create this service so i mean dredging seems to be right in line with everything that the united states is doing is it's developing into a major global ocean power you know it doesn't want 
itself to be dependent upon, you know, 100% dependent on foreign resources. You have the Great White Fleet goes around the world and, and it's, it's serviced by uh, foreign colliers that have to sp supply fuel and, and the army, the Navy goes, well, we need these, we need to buy these. And, and this just yeah. seems to be the next in the evolution here. It's like, listen, our ports need to be open and maintained. And it also goes to the geography of the United States, which is so diverse. <laughs> I know it's huge. It's huge. I, I, I think when we compare ourselves to Netherlands and Belgium, there, there's a missing here. You know? is the third the size of Louisiana. It is not an appropriate analog. It's right. not. The United States needs its own fleet for everything. Let's take it that next step then. You come post World War II and everything. So that so next step. We're waiting. They're like, what are we going to do? At the same time, there's the cult of privatization, right? You know, we could save money if we just contract out. You know, government services can be done better if we just pay someone else to do it. And so several uh, forces aligned to hold the new funding for new dredgers and for the Army Corps to update and fix its fleet hostage. And it was, you know, the dredging contractors of America and the then um, CEO of Chicago Great Lakes Dredge and Dock. Um, and they said, no, you cannot do that until you pay for a study. I forget the name of the, the consultancy, but it's one of the original management consultancies like Deloitte or Bain, one of those, but they're prior incarnations who carried out the study and said, you know, the core, um, we could, they could outsource hundred percent of their work with only 20% cost um, increase. And that's, I mean, even with that, um, you know, I read the original committee hearing back and forth, you know, the ports were vehemently against it, absolutely against it from the beginning. You know, the, they were like, we we're gonna be where we were 60 years ago where we didn't have enough um, capacity to dredge the ports to depth, don't do this. Be that as it may, they did. Um, I forget, 1971, um, Congress ordered the Corps to, you know, contract out in uh, all cases unless it was more than 20% the cost of what the Corps would use. And over uh, sub several subsequent rounds of legislation from the 70s on, um, you would see from the Senate House Natural Resources and Water Committee, um, like little tiny tucked in things in like, you know, the Oceans Act, WERDA, um, bills to restrict the Corps' access to its own fleet. Because there's several boats already that exist that are really old. You know, there's one on the Pacific, there's one on the East, and there's one in New Orleans in the Gulf. And they would say, okay, the Wheeler is restric restricted to 180 days. You know, the McFarland is restricted to this many days. Okay, now they're ready reserve status, which means they have to be maintained, they have to be crewed, at a cost of several million dollars a year, but the Corps cannot use them. They are literally restricted from using their own fleet. So they have to purchase dredging from a private fleet. And the theory throughout all of this was that the private industry would invest and maintain a world-class fleet. Well, where are we today? We, and that's where we are. We have the ever stuck. You know, we have a fleet completely incapable of, of competing on an international stage and incapable of meeting our domestic maritime security needs. And I think I tweeted the other day an example that was relayed to me and told to me the story of Ship Island. Ship Island is a barrier island off the coast of Mississippi. And um, for whatever reason, the core uh, was the, the, the group to restore it. And I spoke to the, the commanding officer, like a civil engineer on this project. And, you know, the problem is, is that the core, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge organization with a huge country, you know, you have the Port of Houston, you have the Port of San Diego, you have all these ports competing for uh, 15 boats, you know, four of which are dry docked pretty much and ready reserve status. And so they have to basically plan and compete amongst themselves. So the first phase of Ship Island, they divided it into two phases, so they wouldn't take away that boat too long from like the East Coast or someone else. So they divided it in two phases. They did one. They, did, they stitched the island first part. And then nine months later, the, the cost, same boat, same like dimensions of the project, it doubled in cost because the because you know, that's the thing where the industry is not competing, the government is competing for the, these few boats. So that's where we are. We are unable to dredge our ports to depth. We are unable to armor and protect our coastal communities from storms. You know, the Army Corps of Engineers relies heavily on benefit cost analysis. So it's like if you're a rich, you know, Northeast 
Hamptons type community, your BCA ratio is going to be better than some poor community in South Carolina. So you're more likely to get the, the sand put in front of your house than some other community with more people. And so that's where we are. We are rationing a public good and service. We are rationing national security because a private cartel has you know, held these services ransom. And well, these both are shitty and old and bad. Right. And, and, you know, I, I looked at that list you posted on uh, Twitter a while back and, you know, those six acts that were passed in the 19, you know, from the 1960s forward. And you're right. I mean, they, they sit there and they manipulate the government fleet, restricting their use of operations and really hamstring the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers, too, is at the bottom of the totem pole of army appropriation and funding. They, they they find themselves in very much a similar situation I do with the sea lift aspect where, okay, you know, no one's going to fund, no, no one pays money to build a dredge. You know, it's like no one's going to the launching of a new dredge. It's it's not seen as as a very sexy or very uh, enticing okay. issue. And, and uh, but it's, it's so quintessentially essential. And yet we, we've done it. And I think this is the thing I got from reading all your work is, is how much we have underfunded this element of infrastructure and and really that that's the core issue to me. It's it's not so much where the dredges come from. It's the underfunding of of the issues here. And we have not invested, you know, listening to Tracy and Joe talk to the two people they had. And I, I love Tracy and Joe. I love their Outlaws podcast. I think it's great. But listen to those two talk about it. What they're talking about is shifting uh, the two guests they had on board is shifting us from an American monopoly to a foreign monopoly. That's basically what they want to do. And and, the, and and then removing the, the the army fleet entirely from this. And to me, that really puts us at in the hands of the whim of these companies. You know, I mean, because we're going to be competing not just between American ports, we're going to be competing worldwide for these dredges. And if there's a project that needs their attention somewhere, we're going to have to compete against them. And, right. and you know, I, I think that's one of the elements because, you know, one of the things they talked about is, you know, if there's an issue, if there's a storm comes in, we at least have the ability to relocate dredges within the United States fleet to handle this. If, if storm hits a port and it gets sanded in and we need to get it cleared, that we can allocate dredges to that. So I, I guess that comes to the issue of, of today in many ways is what what's the policy or what should be the policies is if 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 megan is the czarina Zar, of of dredging in the united states you know uh what 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 is the policy that we want to see going forward because i think we, we do need to deal with this i think i think the ever forward highlighted some issues i mean i should mention we got the ship out it was dredged out and maybe not has been out as fast as if there were more modern dredges available or a larger number of dredges available but i think i also think some of the some of the examples they used in that auto lots podcast is complete fallacy no one's dredging houston ship channel to 100 feet that's ridiculous no one's going to dredge 100 feet down uh the, the 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 issue they even mentioned the fact that container ships can only get in once a week in the houston that's wrong i mean just look at marine traffic you know the issue isn't dredging that's keeping container ships out it's the container terminal getting containers off the ship out there's right oh. now i just looked before our interview there are ships going i mean they're doing the houston ship chicken right now going in and out with ships going both ways there's two-way traffic in the chip in the ship channel so anyway what would you what would you think megan all right well first off let's you know i agree we're underfunding these basic like national defense you know, public goods and services. Absolutely. Also, since we privatized the fleet, you know, the amount dredged has gone, has shrunk by half and the price, the unit price, like the cubic yard per dollar doubled. So we're spending more for less. So that's something just to understand and like a little background for the audience. Yes, every uh, person who was behind these pieces of legislation did go on to work for lobbyists that represented Great Lakes Dredge and Dock. So just so you know, it was a very explicit cronyism that was the like reasoning and justification for this. But if Megan was in charge of this, because this is a national defense issue, I would give, I would make the Army Corps of Engineers the Army Corps of Engineers again, and not the Army Corps of Contract Officer Representatives. I would give them their fleet back. First, I would repeal every piece of legislation. I have uh, a bill in the works. If you are um, a congressional person, a staff member, someone on a committee, Hit me up. I got a bill ready to go. 
let's do this. Um, we repeal, I mean, I'm like, I have like, it's really so many things like section 106 of public law, number 103-126, like it's so needly, all these little things like restrict them to this many days, restrict them to this many days. I would green light the, the building of a new fleet, at least 16 hopper vessels across the United States. The Gulf needs at least three. If you look at the port crisis, if you look at the coastal crisis, you look at Miami, you look at you know, Ike Syke in Houston, you look at Louisiana's coastal restoration program, we need at least three vessels working exclusively on coastal restoration and ports on the Gulf. Same for the East Coast and certainly the West for their ports. And in support of that, what we need is actual MARAD grants that you know targets specific ports with the capacity. So we, and that's the thing that like, you know, I'm sure your this uh, YouTube discusses, we don't have an actual maritime policy in the United States. We actually do not devote any kind of like, uh, like we don't have industrial policy. We don't have maritime policy, you know, because it's not just like build the boats and they will come. Like, no, we need to invest resources. You know, the Netherlands has what they call the golden triangle where it's you know government, academia, and industry. And they work together. And I actually went to Delft and went to their naval architecture school. And it was incredible. Background, my husband is a naval architect. He went to University of New Orleans. And you know, like you compare that to like that. And it was, I mean, the feeling I felt was shame at first and then anger that we didn't have that. We are the United States of America and we do not have the resource, like even the tiny percentage of the resources that they have. And that's not for a lack of resources. We have the resources, we're just not allocating them correctly. So like part of my bill would also be allocating the resources to these schools. You know, Houston has a towing tank for dredging. You know, the East Coast has a few naval art programs. University of Michigan has a naval art program. We need to train the next generation of engineers and architects to build these boats. Uh, vessels because we are woefully behind our European and Asian counterparts. So that's one, you know, green light the, the building of these boats. Two, three, you know, giving the money to the appropriate shipyards and ensuring that these are union shipyards. You know, if you want to qualify, you have to be, you know, representative, like a good employer. They have to be modernized. In the United States, like the way we fund and prioritize these inland and water resource projects is very like fits and bursts. It's not programmatic. Right. You know, it's like, you know, like, um, like every year we're going to come and like, we're every week we're going to clean the street. We're going to do this. Like there's certain schedules to doing basic maintenance, but that is not the way we treat our inland waterways. It's like, you know, a big environmental study. It's, you know, passed through a giant water resources and development act bill. And then maybe five years later, it'll be appropriated. It is very disjointed. It's very competitive between the states. We need a programmatic, like, you know, predictable funding. And we have, you know, the Harbor Maintenance um, Trust Fund. It's a, a nice pot of money that two, you can- $2 billion dollars about or yeah, so? Trillion, like you could be appropriating this every year. We need to say like, you know, a schedule because that's the thing, River Shoal, you need to dredge them on a routine basis. You know, when you build a barrier island, you're going to have to rebuild it. You know, like the, the sand motor in the Netherlands, it's like acknowledgement that this is a routine process. Areas that we're going to have to nourish, we're going to have to nourish routinely. And so we need an actual like coherent, uh, sensible, you know, inland water and coastal management program. So if I was czar, I'd be doing a lot of things because there's a lot of things to be done. We have to get a lot of shops in order. Well, I, let me first say, Megan, I 100% agree that Marad is is number one. There, there's no direction on this. There's no national policy. I've talked about this till I'm blue in the face at times, I think that we lack a coherent strategy. I talk about the fact that the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, the Jones Act, was a national maritime strategy that has been slowly disassembled over the past 100 years. And, and I do think you're exactly right, is, is number one, for, we can absolutely build dredges in the United States. I mean, we build nuclear aircraft carriers and, and ballistic missile submarines. I mean, you can't tell me we can't build a sophisticated dredge. That would take time and an investment, but we could do it. There's no doubt about that, that, that we can go ahead and start building that. I think you're exactly right that there needs to be a coherent plan. I, I have, I've been very critical of the Maritime Administration over these port infrastructure grants that they're basically just handing out to states and municipalities to build more laydown area, to build more cranes. I mean, we're seeing serious issues that impact strategic you know, defense. There was an exercise in 2019 where the uh, uh, Maritime Administration, along with the Transportation Command, activated about 30 something ships 
to test the readiness of the reserve fleet. And they couldn't get the sh several ships out of Beaumont because the river had flooded and which meant the air draft under the bridge there, they yeah. couldn't get out. And, and this is all, you know, this all involves dredging is why were those ships there? Where they were, why were they in that area and not somewhere else? You know, but that had to do with the availability. And you're right. I, I think, you know, until everybody realizes that the, the, the maintenance of the harbors and waterways in the United States is a huge strategic resource. It's a huge money making for the United States. This is job employment in the United States. This is ships, this is ships repair. This is everything like we don't have to off, offshore this overseas. We can do it right here. And, and you create the infrastructure and building base, which we had for a long time. But like you said, it became very much a political issue with several companies in the United States controlling it. And, you know, the argument I had with what Joe and Tracy did on the show and who they talked to, not really with Joe and Tracy, but with who they talked to, is they're just talking about offshoring that monopoly overseas. And a lot of that element wouldn't even be in the United States. I don't believe the dredges would be repaired in the United States. They'd go overseas. They, they would not, it would do nothing to us. And I think they would find loopholes in employing U.S. mariners. I don't think they would hire union mariners. I think they would hire cheaper mariners who can work for a lot less money than you can in the United States. Uh, and, and your bill you're talking about there, that's the American Waterways Maintenance and Coastal Defense Act that you talked about, I believe, in, in one of your papers. I read it. And I think it's really amazing. I, I think it hits on what gets me is this should be a no brainer among so many politicians because it's not Republican, Democrat. It is. I've heard of them. It is. And, and, and it deals. And it's not even just coastal because you're talking about inland. You're talking about up the Mississippi, up the Ohio, the Great Lakes. I, I mean, you know, except for maybe Montana, right? Except for maybe Montana and Idaho. You know, I think that's about the only states that really they gotta don't. get their corn somewhere. That's true. You're exactly right, and and I I think that's that. This is such a huge element to talk about. What what's your prognosis? I mean, what do you think is is going to happen going forward? If you put on your you know thinking about this, where's the, where's the situation at? Has attention been drawn to this? Do you think there there's the impetus to do this, or are you worried about it? doing what it's done in the past and just kind of, you know, kind of just remaining status quo. I think things are impossible until they're not. And I think it's possible because the influence that these few companies have is negligible compared to the influence ports and the companies that rely upon them have. And, you know, to, to bow down to a few companies, I mean, this was an experiment. It was always intended to be an experiment. Can industry handle and do, you know, a similar job as the core? They failed. The experiment has failed. It is time to go back to the drawing board and say, all right, let's do what we're good at. And the argument to say that like, oh, the Army Corps is not good. We should defund them. Like there's, there's this one guy who's like hiding out my Twitter whose family owns a dredge company. Um, who's like, well, the Corps has failed. And you know, it's like, you know, I come from New Orleans. So certainly we have a mixed relationship with the Army Corps of Engineers and the failure of federal levies that, you know, is partially because of local levy boards. And there's all kinds of things. Like the Corps is also the reason why we're sinking into the ocean. Um, to, but to assert that like government unto itself is like a failure because of past poor decision, that's like, you know, saying I will never go to a restaurant again because I've had bad service. Like we need a a well-equipped military, we need a well-equipped everything. Like government is not onto itself bad and to assert that is very short-sighted. Um, going forward, I think that it's, it's good politics from every possible perspective. You know, my bill would, you know, put money into shipyards on every coast. You know, on the West Coast, the Gulf, you know, the Great Lakes and the East Coast. Do you know how many jobs that would create? How many good jobs, maintenance, fabrication yards? And to crew these boats, you know, you need a good amount of people and the support vessels and the restoration work. You know, you know we haven't talked about the C word, climate change. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, you look at the, the latest NOAA report on sea level rise. We are going to have to have some really frank conversations about a just retreat across the United States, areas like where can we protect what can we armor and what can we not? But we need to, like, we can't armor something if we don't have the tools to armor it. And like the idea that we would somehow turn to Belgium or the Netherlands for this equipment, it's like, should we rent our tanks too? Should we like, you know, put our, uh, you know, our fire trucks on loan from like some other country? It's just ludicrous. It's an absurd proposition. It is the reason why we created the original fleet in the first place because it's just not very strategic. 
No, and, and you know, and, and that was the point I raised when I was on the odd lots is, is I mentioned the fact is it, I wasn't being critical of the fact that we have smaller dredges or less dredging capacity. It's just we've neglected it. And, and the, the solution isn't to go get Egyptian dredges or dredges built in Netherlands and Belgium. It's we need to invest in this strategic resource. Like you said, I, I think it's really important that we do it. And I also think it's very important that it's not just the local congressman as you're talking about, but it's the maritime administration. It's the maritime colleges and universities that should be talking about this left and right. You know, you talked about University of New Orleans, you talked about, you know, all these other education areas, you know, yet we have, you know, the Federal Maritime Merchant Marine Academy with the state maritime universities, and they tend to talk about the blue boats, the blue ocean, go out in the big water, but they don't tend to talk about coastal. Yeah. And as you said, I think coastal resource management is the big topic coming forward. How do we maintain the ports? How do we keep this going? We had such a big focus on dredging the port of Savannah down to 50 feet, all these East Coast ports to handle these Neo Panamax vessels like Everforward. This is the issue. You know, this is what I've been talking about with Everforward. I said the issue with Everforward isn't the fast fact that the vessel is too big, it's just we're not investing enough to handle vessels this big. That means tugboats, that means fireboats, and that means dredges, and that means more robust capability. Why is it ever given this freed in six days, whereas it takes ever forward 35 days? Well, it's a different grounding, but it's also the amount of resources the Suez Canal had available right there with high capacity dredges, larger tugs, and salvage vessels, whereas in upper Chesapeake Bay, they're just not there. And, and that has to do with the allocation of resources and bringing yes. this matter to the highlight and everything. And, and you know, again, it's the, it's not just about like what we're investing, but who is supplying it. It's critical. It's very important. You know, we, we do not have a military that relies upon private contractors. We do not, because that would be make, you know, our safety and freedoms conditional on some other organization's profit. And that is how it is now. We are our, you know, public defense, our, you know, restoration, all of these things are contingent on a few companies, private profit. And that is, you know, from any perspective, you know, not the, the correct way to organize this. It needs to be a public fleet. We need to, to fund it, we need to staff it, and it needs to be ours. Absolutely. It needs I to be the public fleet. And I think you hit on that key thing. I mean, it doesn't mean the elimination of commercial dredging by any means, because there's still going to need to be supplement to that. Yes. But, you know, as long as you have that basis to do it. And again, this legislation that you so well identify that really limits the ability of that public fleet to operate, the lack of funding, the lack of construction. I, I mean, this is this is such a priority issue. I, I think that going forward, you know, in many ways, what happens with Ever Forward could be a good, you know, precursor you know tell people yes. okay here's the warning here's the warning this is what happened this is a cargo ship that got stuck what happens if it's an aircraft carrier what if it's a major american naval unit what if a port closes and you can't get the ships out of the harbor or you can't deploy and, and i think that's where we find ourselves right now megan first i want to i want to say one thing about commercial dredging right yeah. like so there's two scenarios right Okay, let's say the Dutch and the, we, we overturn the Foreign Dredge Act, we gut the, the Jones Act a little bit more and we allow these companies to come in. They will crush these American dredging companies like they crush fresh bedrock with their clamshell dredgers. They will be absolutely obsolete in a decade if we open that. And, and on a certain level, that would be enjoyable for me to watch, but it would not be in the benefit of the American people. But instead, if we go with this, we invest in our public fleet, there would still be a place for the commercial fleet as it is today. You know, Miami Beach is still like, you know, private beaches still need some uh, nourishment in front. That wouldn't be a priority for the Army Corps of Engineers, but that could be an opportunity for a small dredging company. You know, a small harbor that is you know, in line for a project, but they want to do it now. Like a lot of the LNG projects, you know, like, uh, like Port Fouchon, you know, could have its own, um, crew of commercial dredgers on retainer. You know, there's still opportunity under that scenario for these private commercial dredgers. But if we open up the doors, they will be crushed because they have not stayed competitive intentionally. Right. And I think if, if the Army Corps of Engineers builds state-of-the-art dredgers, that's going to set the bar. And, and then the commercial companies will have to meet that bar in many ways. Because like you said, if you open it to foreign, I mean, it's just going to be, it's going to happen what happened with, with uh, the reflagging of P&O ferries over in Great Britain, where they went from the British flag to the Cyprus flag. And then one day they fired everybody, you know, and they replaced the British crews with Indian crews. 
And, you know, th that's that's what will happen. There's no doubt that will happen. I, the, the lobbyists can say what they want right now. But once that happens, once they've run out the competition, they can do what they want. And you find yourself at the mercy. And that's the argument I've been making for a long time with U.S. shipping is, is once you eliminate that, you're at the mercy of these international companies and they've shown themselves to be profit companies. They want profit. And, and you know, competition is going to hinder that. If they can get rid of it, they'll do it and they'll keep moving on. Megan, you've given us a lot of time and I've kept you away from certain things today. But uh, before we wrap up, is there anything closing or anything you want to wrap up for us? And most importantly of all, let everybody know where they can get in contact with you if you want them to get in contact with you uh, and, and what you have working on the horizon. Oh goodness. Um, I'm just going to end with, you know, we did great things before and we can do them again. You know, we built a, a massive public dredge fleet before and it, it is something to look back on with pride and we can have that pride again and we can meet our nation's needs with our own vessels again and we'll create jobs and it is a political no brainer for any politician. I don't care what side of the aisle you are on. Dredge boats are great. Boats are great. You know, think of some good names. I think John Wolf Ambrose would be a good name for a first dredge boat, um, the grandfather of it all. Um, I, I sailed that of Am Ambrose Channel for a long time, so I know. I, I, I know. I'm glad you gave me this background on him. Actually, it's great. Yeah, I mean, we could talk again about John Wolf Ambrose <laughs> and how he helped start public health as we know it in New York. It's it's pretty incredible. Um, where you can find me? So I'm a Twitter Bayou Terrier, B A Y O U Terrier. Um, you can go to my website, truetransition.org. I know it's in the process of being fixed. If you want to learn about orphaned oil wells, that's a whole other side beat that I do. Um, and if you want to reach me, just, you know, DM me on Twitter. I don't want to give my email address because, you know, people. No, that's that's great. That. That's great. <laughs> and and uh, what are you working on in the future? I mean, obviously you're working on the abandoned uh, oil wells project right now. That seems to be a topic that, uh, like I said, I went to the website, looked at it. I think it's a really interesting one. Obviously, it's, it's an issue that has huge environmental issues in the future. So, I mean, with that, isn't it a whole side conversation, but I would like to create a new federal administration that directly employs oil and gas workers to identify, plug and abandon, and monitor oil and gas wells in perpetuity. Because, you know, you drill a hole in the ground, you know, it's a steel casing. What do we know about steel? It corrodes. What do we know about pressure? It builds. Oil and gas wells are forever. They're more akin to nuclear waste than the industry wants you to know. And we need a well-trained workforce to, to monitor that and replug it in perpetuity. So that's one thing I'm working on is to create lots of government, um, <laughs> to create a lot of public jobs, because we have a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, yeah. I, I think I, I think you're right. I, I mean, obviously, you know, oversight is such a big thing. And, and you know, I, I know you kind of joke about that a little bit. But I mean, sometimes you need government to kind of do things that the commercial industry will no longer do. And, and especially when they leave and abandon these things, because we've seen that across the board with a lot of uh, waste and leakage into areas, into water, waterways and into water systems that needs to be done. I did a whole thing on the uh, DOD's uh, uh, fuel facility over at Red Hill in Hawaii and the issue associated yeah, with yeah. that. So, I mean, it's obviously a big thing. Megan, I want to thank you for joining us today and for filling such a great gap, I think, in why a U.S. dredge fleet is, is so important. To everybody who's watching, I'll have Megan's contact information there for you. You can take a look at it. I'll link over to her article in Current Affairs over to her Twitter feed, too. So if you want to follow Megan, please do so. And for everybody else watching, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. So be alerted about new videos when they come out, leave a comment. I have a feeling we'll have some comments on this YouTube video. Give it a thumbs up, just a thumbs up. We really don't want the dislikes. And most importantly at all, share it across social media, share it with your favorite congressman, their staffer, everyone across the board. You can send it over to my buddies and Megan's buddies over at Cato. They'll enjoy this. They'll have a good time. I know them. Hi, guys. Hi, I, I guys. How you doing? Uh, they'll have a good time watching this. Until our next episode, this is Sal and Megan signing off. Thank you so much. Have a great day.